من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أحمده وأستعينه وأؤمن به وأتوكل عليه ثم أصلي وأسلم على خاتم أنبيائه وأفضل سفرائه محمد وآله الطاهرين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين المهدي المنتظر فداه أرواح العالمين I spoke the past two nights about wudu Now if you have a valid excuse a good reason not to do wudu then the second option is tayammum So one of the reasons may be that you are sick and the water is too cold, you may get more sick, then you could do tayammum. Or if you don't have water, or if you have water that's only enough for drinking, then you can do wudu. There are a lot of conditions. I'm not going to mention them. I don't have enough time. But these are some of the reasons why you may be able to do tayammum. But before I speak about the act of tayammum, I just need to mention one thing. If you wake up one day and you don't have water in your tap, that is not a good reason for you to do tayammum. You could buy a bottle from the store. But imagine if you were just completely out of water, so no water in store, no water in the tap, no water at all, then that's still not a good enough reason for you to do tayammum. If there is a chance that water could come back and be up and running before the time for salat ends, then you have to wait. So there's, if, if there's good evidence that there could be water, then you have to wait. And when it gets too late for you to wait for running water, you may want to do you want you may want to pray both salawat even if you leave a little bit time for mustahabbat so tasbih al-fatim zahra things like this then you could do tayammum so when you're really running out of time the other th- condition is that you have to wait until after adhan so even if there's no water at all you're in the desert you have no water then you have to wait until after adhan then you could do tayammum so even if there's no chance that there could be water, you can't do tayammum from before the adhan. You have to wait until after the adhan, then you do your tayammum. So, how do you do tayammum? Very simple. You hit your hands, the palms on, you hit it or you put it on the earth. We'll speak about what the earth means. Then you start from the hairline. Again, the same thing goes for tayammum. I mentioned this about wudu from the average person's hairline. So if you have a receding hairline, if you're going bald, then you don't need to start from the back of your head. You start from the hairline and you wipe from the hairline until the beginning of the arch of the nose. As a precaution, you need to also wipe your eyebrows. So you wipe all of your forehead, including your brows, until the arch of the nose. Then. You wipe your right hand, the top of your right hand, with the palm of your left hand. You wipe it entirely, and then you wipe the second hand. With the palm of your right hand, you wipe your left hand. As a precaution, some scholars say that after you did this, it's a recommended precaution, you do not have to do it, you, you, you could put your hand on the earth again and wipe over your hands again. So from you first wipe your right hand with your left palm, then you wipe your right, uh, your left hand, excuse me, with your, excuse me, left hand with your right palm. Very confusing for me. It must be more confusing for you. So this is a recommended precaution. Again, the same conditions apply that I mentioned about wudu. There has to be tartib, so you have to do it in the order that it came in. And you have to do it with mu'alat. So you do 
one after the other. You can't wait for 20 minutes, then wipe your left hand, for example. So, you wipe from the beginning of your hands, so from the wrist, and again, the same thing, I mentioned this about wudu as well, it's better to go a little bit further, just so you make sure that it covers everything. You start from the beginning of the wrist until the ends of your fingers for both hands. One more condition, and I'll wrap up with this. If you do tayammum, before you pray, you get water. So you get your hands on water. Then you, you have to redo your wudu. It's not enough for you to pray with that tayammum. However, if you did tayammum, then you prayed after you finished prayer, even if it was still the time of prayer, water comes back, you don't need to do wudu and you don't need to redo your prayer. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Traditionally, they speak about Al-Qasim ibn al-Hasan on the eve of the 8th of Muharram. We are inspired by the story of Al-Qasim to speak about disciplining children, how to raise children. And even though Al-Qasim was only three when his, probably three when his father his father planted the seeds. He made him turn into what Al-Qasim was on the day of Ashura. So before the day of Ashura, he overhears his uncle, Imam Al-Hussein, speak about how everyone will die on the day of Ashura. He asked his uncle, am I part of those that will be killed in your way, O Abu Abdullah? The Imam wants to test him. He says, what do you think about death? He says, Feek, in your way, sacrificing myself for you, sweeter than honey. He was probably only 13 when he said this. We'll speak about how to raise children to be, well, not like Al-Qasim, but people that will, inshallah, be in the footsteps of Al-Qasim. Some of us, some people, wrongfully and falsely believe that they are self-sufficient, that they are independent. Even if they don't say it, they believe it down in their hearts. So they think if I already have a car or if I have money to buy a car, then I don't need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a car. Even though you have the means, you still need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for things that you can get and for the things that you already have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa, I love the person that asks. Ask me for anything, including the salt for your food. In another hadith, Allah says, I love an insisting person. If you want something, insist and insist and insist. There's nothing wrong with asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I mentioned this last night as well, very briefly. I said that you cannot plan greatness. You don't choose to be great. You do what you have to do, your responsibilities and your duties, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it great if He wishes, if you're sincere. And I also spoke a little bit about this very briefly on the night of Umm al-Banin. What, what made Umm al-Banin great? It's the fact that she knew that she could not outdo Fatima to Zahra. And she put all of her existence into raising children that would sacrifice themselves for the son of Zahra. And that made her great. One of the greatest people we speak about in the story of Ashura. And you can Google the story as well. I don't recall the names, but I, I remember I read about this somewhere. When the Wright brothers wanted to invent a plane, there was also a, 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 either a millionaire or a multimillionaire that had invested a lot of money into inventing the plane. But even though he had all the means, he had all the scientists on board, 
He couldn't do it because it's not something that you choose to do. And Allah huwa razzaq dil quwwatil mateen. Allah chooses whether to give you or not to give you. And on the other side, there are two brothers. They don't have all the knowledge, they don't have all the money. But Allah chose for them to invent the plane. So you don't get to choose the things that you want. Allah gives it to you. Part of this is a good, observant, and obedient son. Once you understand that it's, God, that it's God's gift to you and that God gives you a good, disciplined son, then you know who to ask. You know that you need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a good son. That is one point. That it's in God's hands and that you need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reading an entire encyclopedia about parenthood does not necessarily make your children great. It's what God chooses for you. And the second thing is to be a good person yourself. What do they call it here? They call it karma. You can't do bad things to your parents and expect for your kids to be good kids. You can't be disrespectful to your parents and expect for your kids to be respectful. That's not how it works. And there are a lot of examples. I'll mention two examples. In terms of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the good people good children. In the story of Khidr and Musa alayhi salam, when they saw this little child, Al-Khidr killed the child. Musa said, why did you kill a, a small child? He didn't do anything. Khidr said, this child was going to grow up to be a tyrant, a murderer, a killer. My father always mentions this example. He said, if you, you, know, if, if you could imagine that someone knew what Saddam was going to be, what would they do to a small little child in Fallujah? I'm not condoning anything. I'm just saying, I'm just mentioning the story of Khidr. So, they, so he killed that child, but what did the parents get instead? They got a little girl. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to give from the descendants of that girl 70 prophets. Why? Because their parents were good people. Salihain, the Quran says. This is the first story. And the, and the second story is also about parenthood in the same story of Khidr and Musa. When they went to a village and they asked for food, they were hungry. The people of the village didn't give them food. So they were walking out of the village when they saw a falling wall. Al-Khidr suddenly came and he fixed the wall and he put it back up. Musa said, you know, if, if you wish, you could have gotten some, something out of this. You could have asked the village for something for this in return. So Al-Khidr said that this wall belonged to two children whose father was a good person. They were working outside the city. And that behind this wall was a treasure. Once they grew up, they were going to open this and they, they were going to get the treasure. Or else the people of the village were going to steal their treasure. So you really plant the seeds of your son when you deal with your own parents. And again, even if you are a good person, it raises your, your chances dramatically, but it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a good child. Maybe this is one of your tribulations, one of your trials, that Allah gives you a bad child. However, being good raises your chances. This is the second thing. So be a good person yourself. The third thing to keep in mind is to choose wisely. And this is something that applies to both the men and the ladies. You really have to choose wisely when you're choosing a spouse. And there are two stories that I'd like to mention. One is the story of this lady that called my mother who had gotten married to a moderate Sunni. She said that when I got married to know him, when I got to know him, he was a good person. I don't know whether she got married to him because of his wealth or his looks or whatever it was. However, when they grew up and the things in 
in the Middle East happened, suddenly this moderate turned into a fanatic. He was against her, against her beliefs. And what happened was that her own children suddenly began to speak against her and her beliefs. She could have very easily not gone through this had she chosen wisely from the beginning. And the same thing applies to the men. Choose wisely. Just because she's a blonde doesn't mean that your children are going to turn out to be good children. Look for the mu'minat. Look for the, go the, the good people and the good families. And the third thing is very important in my opinion. And it's to educate yourself. For some reason I feel like a lot of us, including me, are very uneducated in terms of religious knowledge. There was a, a very good neurosurgeon that I know. And this guy, I could confidently say that he was the best in his country, or he is the best in his country, and one of the top maybe 10 in the world. He's a very good person, very well read. But even though he, he was such a knowledgeable person, he would always tell me, he says, you know what, all the books that I've ever read, everything that I've, that I've heard and lectured about in the university, I take off all of that knowledge the same way that I take off a flip-flop and sit down and open Wasail al-Shia, the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt. So you really need to educate yourself with the ahadith. These are things, again, I mentioned this. A good, obedient, observant, religious son is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should at least know what Allah says about this, what the Prophet says about this, what the Ahlul Bayt say about this. And I, I remember I saw an interview with a divorce lawyer, and he was saying this. He said, when you buy a house, you get a whole, a whole document full of papers or a, a drawer of documents, things about your insurance, about the house itself, about your lawyers, about your mortgage. But what do we read when we get married? People barely even read a pamphlet. You need to know your own rights and you need to know the lady's rights over you. That's why so much oppression happens. Women oppress the men and the men oppress the women because they don't know their rights, they don't know their boundaries. So this is the third thing, educate ourselves. Read about this in the Quran and the Ahadith. And lastly, I'd like to end with this. Look at the intricacies of raising a child and, and disciplining a child. The Hadith says, at the age of three, so, when the child gets to three years of age, prompt him to say, La ilaha illallah, three, excuse me, seven times. Then, when he reaches three years, seven months, and 20 days, if you want to write this down, write this down, or after the lecture, you could take this from me. This is a very good hadith. When he reaches three years, seven months and 20 days, of course this is in the lunar calendar, you have to prompt him to say Muhammadun Rasulullah seven times. <laughs> then when he reaches four years of age, excuse me, when he finishes four years, prompt him to say Sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alih. <laughs> Also seven times. Then when he finishes five years, he is asked to tell the difference between his right arm and his left arm. Then you make him stand in front of the qibla and he is asked to do sujood. Very simple. Then you leave him for two years. You don't, you don't tell him to do anything for two years. When he finishes seven years, he is prompted to wash his face and his hands. So not wudu, he is prompted to wash his face and his hands. 
and ask to pray. And of course, throughout this period, he's seeing you pray. You are his role model. Then at nine, he is taught to do wudu. What happens at the end? The Imam says, Allah lahu wa liwalidayhi insha'Allah. So this is, this is how to raise a child. You can't expect to read, you know, if, even if you're a psychiatrist or a psychologist, you can't expect for your child to be a good person. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is what Allah says. These are the documents that you have to read and apply. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us children that will be able to serve their imam insha'Allah. Wa sallillahumma ala muhammadin wa ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin.